Welcome to the Inside Elections Podcast, where we analyze elections in a nonpartisan, data-driven, and accessible way. In this episode, we'll talk through the upcoming Democratic primary for Senate in Maryland and the general election that will greet the eventual winner. And we'll also dive into one of the big House primaries taking place in the old line state. And we'll do it all with the help of special guest Pamela Wood, politics reporter from the Baltimore Banner. Buckle up. I'm Jacob Rubashkin, Deputy Editor of Inside Elections, the go-to place for nonpartisan political analysis for more than 40 years. Uh, Now, I have not had a particularly interesting travel schedule over the last week or so, but I believe that Nathan's busy itinerary more than makes up for that. Uh, So, Nathan... Tell us what you're about this week. Yeah, well, and I'm Nathan Gonzalez, editor and publisher of Inside Elections. I'm currently in San Antonio, Texas, uh, specifically Texas 35th district, getting ready to speak to the uh, Farm Credit Bank of Texas. Uh, yesterday, I was in Raleigh in North Carolina's second district speaking to a group. Um, tomorrow, I will be in Dallas, Texas, in Texas sixth district speaking to another group. So I am all over the place, and that's why uh, people don't get to uh, those you. Folks watching on YouTube don't get to see my typical background because I'm in a lovely San Antonio ballroom or San Antonio hotel room. I will be in a ballroom in about an hour, but uh, in a hotel room right now. Oh, I think the the interior decorator with those with those tastefully positioned frames is is doing us some favors there behind you. Yeah, well, when uh, I so when I, and when I set this up, uh, the horse picture I was I was right in front of the horse picture, and I had these ears like the ears of that picture. I'm like, I better I better move this to the side a little bit. So hopefully we we got the shot a little bit better. Yeah, it looks great. So uh, a little later on, we're going to talk through Maryland, uh, all things Maryland with Pamela. But before we do that, let's go over a few brief headlines, uh, the latest in congressional news. Nathan, what happened over the last couple of weeks that our listeners should not miss? Well, on Tuesday, Shamari Figures won the Democratic primary runoff in Alabama's second district and is likely to be a member of Congress next year. He's a young black attorney in his late 30s. He was deputy chief of staff to U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland. He also worked on the Hill for Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown. Now, this is the redrawn district with a substantial black population that includes Montgomery, parts of uh, Mobile and rural counties along the, the Black Belt. Biden won it with about 56% in 2020, so it's not an extremely Democratic district, uh, but attorney uh, Caroline Dobson won the Republican runoff and was considered the weaker of the two Republican candidates in that race. And so figure starts this election, uh, this general election, as the considerable favorite uh, to effectively take over what was a Republican seat because of this redraw. Yeah. So Dobson defeated uh, former state senator Dick Brubaker in the Republican primary runoff. Brubaker was a kind of well-regarded uh, state lawmaker who had you know, roots in, 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 I believe, the Montgomery area and placed first in the, in the initial primary, but was not able to defeat Dobson in the runoff. And I know that he was the re- Republican that Democrats were a little bit more uh, concerned about, but uh, figures, you know, f- figures. I think was always going to be the favorite here. He he placed first in the primary uh, in the initial primary. He's also the only one from the district. I think uh, the his opponent Anthony Daniels is actually from uh, Huntsville, so all, all the way in the northern part of the state. The the other thing I'll note here is that. You know me, I'm big on my Nepo babies of Congress, that that story that I wrote a couple years back. And when I do the update, Shamari figures will be a, a part of it. Uh, he is the son of uh, two very high profile state lawmakers, 
his father, who's now deceased, uh, was the president pro temp of the Alabama State Senate back, I believe, in the 80s. His mother I, is, is still a state senator, I believe, both very prominent figures in the black political community in Alabama. And figures leaned into it. He ran lots of ads talking about the, the lineage of service in his family and, and the work that his parents did in advocating for civil rights. So uh, he will be he'll be in the update uh, for sure there. And I have to say the last thing about this race before is that uh, figures in the in the runoff defeated a candidate named Anthony Daniels. And Anthony Daniels happens to be the same name as the actor who played C-3PO in Star Wars. I made that reference in a speech to a group. And it was crickets, Jacob. Nobody. It just there was nothing, no response whatsoever. And so uh, I guess I I learned uh, you when you're talking to groups, you learn what jokes work and what uh, uh, what works and what doesn't. And that did not that did not work at all. That but did anyway, not Jacob, work. What, what did you find? So House and Senate candidates had to file their quarterly financial reports this past week, uh, telling us how much they raised and spent in the first three months of the year. Uh, Democrats have generally been outperforming Republicans on the hard dollar side, the dollars that candidates are raising themselves. Uh, Our friends at National Journal crunched the numbers and found that Democrats' most vulnerable members raised on average $832,000 over the first three months of the year, compared to $737,000 for the most vulnerable Republican incumbents. Uh, And of the 16 challengers, 16 House challengers, outraised the incumbents that they were running against. 14 of those were Democrats. Uh, Just two were Republicans. I've got a story coming out uh, in the next issue of the newsletter about Arizona's sixth district. That was one of those uh, races where the Democratic challenger, former state Senator Kirsten Engel, actually almost doubled up uh, Republican incumbent Juan Siscomani. Uh, She raised almost $1.2 million over the first three months of the year. He raised just a little bit over uh, $600,000. So the small dollar donations for the Democrats seem to be picking up and you know we'll see how big an advantage that gives them uh, but it's certainly something for for Democrats in the house to be hopeful about uh, moving forward and as a reminder to maybe the more normal people that are listening to the to the podcast candidate fundraising matters in in at least one regard that candidates pay less for their television ads than the parties or the super PACs and so when you get into a, a competitive race and uh, in, let's say the Republican candidate is underfunded compared to the Democratic candidate and the parties come in to to try to compensate the parties or the, the super PACs are re- spending two or three times the amount of money for the same number of actual television ads that that are on on TV. So it can be done. The parties can make up that difference. It's just much less efficient and cost effective uh, to do it when the on the party side. So that's why the both Republicans and Democrats want their candidates to raise as much money as possible because it's a better use of of TV dollars. Yeah, it can often be as much as three times, four times as expensive for outside groups to come in. And especially, again, not to harp on that Arizona race, but you know, those the Arizona media markets are going to be very expensive this cycle between a highly competitive presidential race and a highly competitive Senate race. And so uh, while you know, Siskamani is not in such bad position that he has less money overall than Angle does. Uh, there are, uh, it, it's never good to be outraised two to one. There are a few Republican incumbents who now trail their Democratic challengers in cash on hand. Uh, Democrats have been doing well on the money side uh, so far. I want to welcome our special guest, Pamela Wood of the Baltimore Banner. Uh, Pamela has covered Maryland politics for years at the Baltimore Sun, at the Capitol Gazette, and now at the Banner, which is a really cool newsroom that uh, opened up a couple years ago in Baltimore. Recommend you check it out. Uh, We are so glad to have her on the show today. Pamela, thank you for being here. We're going to talk all sorts of races in Maryland, but before we get to all that, you got to answer the question that all of our guests get posed when they come on the show, which is, what congressional district did you grow up in? 
Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. This is exciting. So I am a, a Marylander since age 10, and I grew up in what is now the third congressional district. I grew up in Howard County, Maryland. So for folks from DC area, you probably know where that is. And actually, I still live in the district today over in Anne Arundel County, but uh, Maryland has been quite gerrymandered in the past. It bumped around to a bunch of different districts. It was the seventh for a while. Uh, but yeah, grew up in the third and currently live in the third. Yeah, and I think that the third district especially was kind of ground zero for the gerrymandering from from 2010 to 2020. It uh, really was. There was a judge called it uh, like a broken winged pterodactyl laying prostrate <laughs> across the state. Very uh, specific. So, Very specific. Yes. And that is actually an accurate description. The third was terrible. And then the second kind of wrapped around it. I lived there for a while as well. As an adult. So that uh, that part of Maryland has grown a little bit since you were a kid. But what was life like uh, growing up in in the in the third district back then? Well, I grew up in uh, Columbia, uh, in Howard County, the the choose civility county, the Jim Rouse developer idealized uh, version of a you know multicultural like multi income community, which is you know not quite its ideals, but it's uh, as a kid it was quite boring uh, actually. <laughs> As an adult, <laughs> as an adult, I appreciate, uh, you know, what Columbia is like. There's a lot of greenery. There's uh, a lot of uh, tot lots and walking paths. It's very kind of ideal, you know, suburbia. Well, and for those for those people who are tuning in, maybe for the for the first time, not only a Pamela, but we have, we're very Maryland heavy because Jacob is from Montgomery County. So, <laughs> but that's good. That's good for this oh. for this episode. <laughs> Yeah, always, always enjoy talking about Maryland here on the show. So yeah, let's get right into it. Uh, we've got this big Senate race uh, coming up in Maryland, big Democratic primary, big general election. We're going to talk about both. We're going to start with the primary. Uh, let's take a brief listen to a couple of campaign ads uh, that were recently on the airwaves from uh, Congressman David Trone and Prince George's County Executive Angela Also Brooks in this Democratic primary. I served time in prison. There's a lot of resources that I can't access. Congressman Trone put his reputation on the line to back someone he never even met. The hardest part of being a prosecutor is standing next to that mother that's just lost her child. Few took that responsibility more seriously than Angela also Brooks. Angela fought to convict the man that killed my son. So clearly a contrast in messages uh, from Congressman Trone, the the billionaire owner of of Total Wine, and uh, Angela also Brooks, the county executive in Prince George's County, a former prosecutor, as you heard in that ad. Uh, we're under a month until uh, election day here in Maryland, or, or there in Maryland, I should say. Pamela, what are you watching in the closing weeks of this contest between Trone and also Brooks? Yeah, what's interesting about Trone and also Brooks is despite kind of those divergent ads, really you're not getting a lot of difference policy-wise between the two of them. Either one of them would be a reliable Democratic vote for, you know, uh, making legal abortion and reproductive rights across the country, for example. But what's interesting here is that David Trone is massively, and I mean massively, self-funding his campaign. He is up to almost $42 million of his own money. Angel also brooks no slouch of fundraising, but she's at $7 million total over the course of the campaign, almost a year now. The question is, can Angel also brooks get her message out and talk about her leadership and her style compared to David Trone? I mean, David Trone is just blanketing TV, radio, direct mail, and you know, we're about four weeks from a traditional election day. People are already voting by mail. So can also Brooks get her message out and get people to know who she is? Um, or is it just, you know, Trone by default because more people know his name? Yeah. And and we've gotten a, a whole bunch of polls in, in kind of the last couple weeks of this race. I feel like it had been pretty quiet aside from some, some polls the Trone campaign had released themselves. But it seems like they're almost painting a, a little bit of a contradictory picture. Some of them have the race tightening. Some of them, I think you wrote about a poll the other day from uh, from from one of the local Fox affiliates, I, I believe, that that showed actually quite a quite a significant gap between the two candidates. Um, 
I guess, do, do we know where, where the race stands today and how much ground also Brooks has to make up? Yeah, it's kind of pola palooza, uh, which is unusual for Maryland, right? We don't normally get this much attention. You know, our races aren't always as competitive. So yeah, uh, Fox 45 in Baltimore with the Baltimore Sun and University of Baltimore had a poll out this week. They had thrown up by 19 over also Brooks. A couple weeks ago, uh, the Baltimore Banner and Goucher College had a poll that had thrown up by nine. And a couple weeks before that, the Washington Post and University of Maryland had a poll that showed him up by seven. So is he extending his lead? But in the middle of that, Angel also Brooks put out an internal that showed at 43 to 40. So within the margin, you know, very tight, but that's an internal poll. So you kind of take that with a grain of salt. Um, it, it's really hard to know. There's still a significant number of undecided. Um, I think the Sun and Fox 45 poll had about 12%, but the earlier polls had more like 20% undecided. So that may be where it comes down to. It's it's hard to gauge. It it, it does look like from the polling throne is ahead, but you know who knows what happens in the final uh, final few weeks. Uh, Pamela, can you talk about the role that I guess identity politics is playing in this primary? Because nationally, we've seen in, uh, Democratic primary voters really wanting to elevate women, elevate candidates of color. Uh, in this case, also Brooks is both, uh, and yet you have David Trone, a old. An aging white guy, uh, you know, leading this race. You also have the state's other senator, Chris Van Hollen, who is a white guy. Like, but but it doesn't so far appear that being a woman of color is really pushing her uh, also Brooks across the line. Do you see that? Uh, do you see that dynamic playing out at all, uh, either past or in the next few weeks? I, I think what's interesting here, it goes to what um, Marylanders want and pay attention to. I mean, yes, Angela also Brooks is a black woman and there have been so few black women in the United States Senate, you know, as you said, underrepresentation of black people, underrepresentation of representation of women, she would embody that. But I think you've got a smart voter in Maryland who doesn't want to vote just based on somebody's race or gender. They want to see what are they going to do for me? And the challenge, again, also Brooks has had is like getting her message out, talking about what she has done as a county executive, what she did as a, a prosecutor. Um, but I think there is some, you know, maybe some hand wringing about are we going to send, you know, for Democrats, are they going to send uh, another white man, you know, to to the Senate? But they also are looking at the general election, which candidate is going to go up best against Republican Larry Hogan, uh, the former two term governor, very popular. And that's an argument that each also Brooks and Trone are making is electability. Like, I'm the one to beat Larry Hogan. So I think there's multiple factors there. Identity uh, and representation is one, but it's one of multiple factors, I think. And how uh, yeah. the battle for Baltimore, I guess, how is the battle for Baltimore going? You were there, uh, I guess you're in Annapolis right now uh, at the at the State House, but being, uh, you know, being in Baltimore, because there isn't a Baltimore candidate in the race, how is that playing out in the primary? Yeah, I'm really interested to see how this turns out. So Trone's base is Montgomery County. That's where he lives. His district goes from Montgomery County up to Frederick and out to Western Maryland. So thinking is that he will do well in Montgomery. Uh, Angela also Brooks, um, she's a county executive of Prince George's. Uh, and those are the two largest counties. So could perhaps they cancel each other out? And then you look at what's the next population center, which is the Baltimore region. Uh, Baltimore City is smaller than the surrounding Baltimore County, but it is like so heavily Democratic. Uh, the county around it is a little more purple. Uh, so they are both playing, you know, strong in Baltimore. I cannot go uh, very, very long ride driving in the car around Baltimore and not hear a David Trone ad. And interestingly enough, one of the radio ads he's running right now in the Baltimore market has Prince George's County leaders uh, endorsing him mm -hmm. and has, you know, the voices of Prince George's County politicians, which is interesting to do in Baltimore. Uh, I'm not quite sure the strategy there, but um, they're, and they're, you know, both been around Baltimore. They're debating Friday night uh, on a TV station in Baltimore as well. Yeah. And, and race, I feel like had been kind of a, an, an undercurrent in, or in this, in this contest for, for a long time, obviously with the, the contrast and, and the backgrounds of the two candidates, but it really did kind of come to the fore in the last month or so when Trone uh, 
accidentally used uh, 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 antiquated racial slur, I guess is the best way to describe it. In, yeah, an- in antiquated a, is a word for it, yeah. A- a- antiquate, right. I mean, it sounded like something from a, a Tarantino movie. Um, but in this congressional hearing, the, the thing, though, that that is kind of on my mind is like that was – four days before the the key bridge collapse and and so i i I guess i wonder how much did that really affect the race if at all some that seems like the kind of thing that could derail a campaign but when you've got such a big event happening so soon after that captures all the media attention um has that uh made a difference and has the also brooks campaign done anything to try and capitalize on the fact that he you know, use that, that, that word was, you know, in his vocabulary to use um, in that hearing uh, when consolidating black voters is so important and chipping away at, at white liberals is so important to, to the also Brooks coalition. Right. Yeah. I think um, people are uncomfortable with that word, you know, probably no matter what your race is, you know, I think probably across the democratic spectrum voters would be concerned about that. Um, and the also Brooks campaign, um, really just kind of sat back. They didn't say any public statements. They didn't do any, you know, social media posts or put it into an ad. They kind of like just let it sit there and, and breathe uh, and, you know, sort of Trone caused his own problem and, and, and sort of watch it play out. But as you noted, a few days later, the key bridge in Baltimore collapsed after being struck by a ship and all of the media attention, all of the public attention went immediately to that for a straight week. Now it's started to ebb a little bit in the news cycle and we're getting some more, you know, politics and other things in there. Of course, you know, in Baltimore, there's also a competitive mayoral race and city council president. There's a lot competing for people's time. And that story did kind of die down. That said, uh, when we called to people who took our poll, a couple people did offer that that gave them pause uh, about David Trone. And, you know, I was just chatting with a, a Democratic voter the other day who said that should be disqualifying. You know, they'll never vote for him based on that comment. So it, it's it'll be interesting to see if people remember that by the time they go to early voting or Election Day voting in May or if they're thinking about it. If they're doing their mail-in ballot now and, um, you know, look, there's time for also Brooks to use that to her advantage, uh, potentially. I don't know if they're going to or not. Uh, that'll be interesting to see for sure. Yeah. And Jacob, this is a, a great a great segue into something you had in your story that you wrote for, for our subscribers at Inside Elections about it appears to be a strategic choice that the also Brooks campaign is making to not go negative on Trone. Uh, now, Tradition, as someone who's been watching campaigns for a little while, usually when someone's in a competitive race, if you're not going negative, then usually it doesn't end well for for the for that candidate. What talk a little bit about that, and then and Pamela, interested in your perspective on the on the on that back and forth. Yeah, this is something that's just been so striking to me that th- this campaign, at least in a paid media environment, has been entirely positive for both candidates. Um, uh, they throw some elbows on on the stump and and in forums, but when it comes to TV ads and 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 paid communications, neither of them have gone after each other, uh, and and that's especially striking to me with with also Brooks because she is trailing and because there are such good hits against Trone. It's not just the racial slur; it's it's the money that he donated to uh, Republicans like Greg Abbott and Doug Ducey. Over the the years, he's obviously donated a lot more to Democrats, but he did sign checks to Republicans. That was a big deal in his 2016 House race that he lost the Democratic primary to Jamie Raskin. It's all out there, and it's clearly uh, salient for Democratic voters, especially at a time when you've got Doug Ducey, who you know uh, appointed the justices on the Arizona Supreme Court that uh, just reinstated that 1864 law, and you've got Greg Abbott in Texas doing all sorts of things that get Democrats mad. Um, and yet they're they're not doing anything with it yet. And I, I think the, w- what I heard was basically that it's it, this is about scarcity of resources and that uh, also Brooks has does not have enough money to do both yet. And that the most important thing is to be introducing herself to voters, especially in the Baltimore media market, getting out that positive message. And it's only after she burns in the positive, if she's still got money, that she can kind of go on the negative. Um 
but uh, you know, it, it it seems like they're they're leaving money on the table, as it were, leaving hits on the table, and there aren't any outside groups like Emily's List or um, you know other other uh, friendly friendly powers out there that have the money and and the motivation. It seems like to to go in and do the dirty work for also Brooks, and I I just wonder if we end up uh, with a Trone victory, whether that strategic decision will be revisited. Um, following the primary. Yeah, I think this has something to do with sort of the way Maryland is. Politicians here like to talk about how it's a middle temperament state. And uh, and honestly, one of my sources is a Democratic strategist who's worked at multiple states and expresses frustration and how people here are too nice and people don't go. <laughs> Like we don't get a lot of, you know, bare knuckle politics. Like two years ago, I covered a gubernatorial primary where there were 10 people on the ballot in the Democratic primary and probably like four or five of them had like legit backgrounds and, and reasons to run. We had two cabinet secretaries. Um, this is the one that was ultimately won by Wes Moore, who is the governor. Um, and on the surface, they, you know, all of the ads were positive. Nobody had a negative hit ad. There in the forums and debates, it was sort of kind of mild, you know, criticism. Now, sure, uh, behind the scenes, were they all trying to plant stories, you know, against each other, their teams? Like, yes, but outside to what the voters saw it was like pretty calm and polite and we're sort of seeing that with with trone and also brooks and i think you hit on a good point she only has so much money and her team believes that when they introduce her to people and that they tell people or she appears in an event that she wins people over and they're kind of going on that strength um because you know that's what they're focusing their money on. Do they have enough money to go negative or respond to a negative if Trone goes uh, Trone goes hard against her? Yeah. Well, it would be interesting to see when when a candidate finally breaks that campaign culture in Maryland to see if it works, right? I mean, I think a lot of people say yeah. they don't like negative ads or they don't want cans to go negative, but then when they hear the negatives, they're like, oh man, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know that. Like, and, and it legitimately impacts their vote. But, you know, you've described a situation where I can, I, it's easier to see the reluctance to penetrate that norm, you know, that normal uh, way of doing things. You don't want to be the first one risking a backlash if you do, but it also could be effective. And it also Brooks appears to be in a situation where she's got to change the, the dynamic of the race uh, because she's going to get outspent, you know, like, continually by millions of dollars. Yeah. I mean, negative campaigning, it works. Like people, voters say they don't want it, but you know, reliably it, it works. And sure. I, I wasn't, I wasn't covering politics at this time, but it's it's my recollection that the the 2016 primary between Van Hollen and Donna Edwards got kind of chippy. Now maybe that was just kind of in the news media environment and and not so much in paid paid media, but it, I always kind of you know living in Maryland at that time, it felt like wow, this is a really contentious. Like these are two people who don't like each other and are really going at it. Um, but yeah, that's probably that, the la that's probably the last one, the most recent one where we've had you know very competitive and like you said, chippy. Um, so that's going back yeah. what eight years now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and you got to go even further back to uh, find not just a primary that was so competitive, but uh, a general election in the Senate in Maryland that uh, really had the chance to go either way. So uh, that's where we're going to go next to the uh, general election that is um, awaiting the winner of this Democratic primary between Trone and also Brooks, um, which will be the first competitive general election in Maryland in 18 years. Let's take a brief listen to the man who is responsible for all that. And that is why I have made the decision to run for the United States Senate not to serve one party, but to try to be part of the solution to fix our nation's broken politics and fight for Maryland. That's exactly what I did as your governor, and it's exactly how I'll serve you in the United States Senate. 
That, of course, was former Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, the two-term Republican who really shocked the state's political class when he made a last-minute entrance, and I, I truly mean last minute, just a couple hours before the filing deadline, into this Senate race. Uh, Maryland hasn't had a competitive general election Senate race in 18 years. In 2006, Ben Cardin uh, defeated Michael Steele by about 10 points. But it looks like we're we're back to that uh, older era. Uh, Pamela, why is Hogan such a compelling candidate for Republicans in Maryland, a state that has not gone Republican for Senate in 40 years, coming up on 50 years, I think? Yeah, it, it's been a long time. And look, I'll be honest, I thought I was going to be done with this election on May 15th. Um, <laughs> and then, that was it, right? Also, Brooke Strone duking it out in the primary, and then whichever one would just sort of like waltz to the general election. The Republican Party in Maryland is really struggling. It, very challenging for them to field competitive candidates. But the exception to that is Larry Hogan. So he is the two-term former Republican governor. He had astonishingly high popularity approval ratings throughout his tenure, you know, often in the 60s, occasionally touching 70. Uh, and he was elected, um, re-elected very easily. He really appealed to, he got some crossover Democrats and enough independents. You know, he was like, I'm not going to raise your taxes. We're going to help business in the state, kind of your chamber of commerce Republican. And, you know, you know, people like that. Nobody wants our taxes raised. And, you know, he did um, better than a lot of other Republican governors in COVID, you know, came through that well. He had, you know, more restrictions and things, which, you know, he, he, he angered more Republicans than Democrats during that time. So yeah, he jumped in at the last minute and suddenly the Democratic Party, whoever their nominee is, is going to go against a formidable candidate who is already popular, already well known, and is getting national money to back his race here in Maryland for Senate. Yeah, I think I saw this morning that the NRSC was already doing a coordinated ad uh, with Hogan. They're clearly uh, highly invested in him. And look, the numbers the numbers show that right if the election were held today, I think Hogan would be the, the clear favorite. It, like you said, it's been a little bit of a pola palooza, but uh, just looking at the, the the most recent surveys, he's either up by four, which is good better than being down by four, or he's up by 20 or you know, I, I think that Fox 45 poll had had some pretty serious leads for him. The the banner poll was a little bit narrower and then the post poll was also uh, kind of right there in the middle. But it, it puts this race on the map, right, in a way that Democrats can't ignore. And, you know, I, I think I, you mentioned a little bit, it, it has kind of changed the tenor of the Democratic primary in terms of surfacing this question of electability uh, to the front of voters' minds and and both Trone and also Brooks having to shift their messaging to 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 address that concern. But I, I, I guess I part of me just kind of wonders how how real do you think Hogan will be when all is said and done? I mean, Maryland is such a democratic state. Uh, it voted for Biden by upwards of 30 points. It has, hasn't voted. You know, Mac Mathias, I think, last one in 1976 as a republic. I mean, is is it possible, um, <laughs> you know, and, and kind of who, if, do you have a sense of who the, the Democrats are who are w would vote for Larry Hogan? Who, who are the Larry Hogan Democrats that are going to be so central to this race uh, come the fall? Yeah, so I think Larry Hogan is a very real candidate and he has a very real shot. Um, now, Maryland does lean democratic all of the you know the ratings still have it lean instead of but instead of like lock solid it's leans democratic and one thing to think about the electorate is that it, it's actually about two to one to one right about you know not quite half uh or about half democratic voters and then Republican voters and then independent, unaffiliated and third party voters. And, you know, it's it, people often say it's two to one Democrats or Republican, but they forget there's a significant portion of independent voters out there. And Hogan has appealed again to those independents and persuadable Democrats with his 
I'm going to be bipartisan, which is an interesting claim from him. Um, you know, I, I'm against taxes. Um, what Democrats are going to have to do, whoever the nominee is, it, and what they are probably going to do is make this a one issue general election campaign about abortion and reproductive rights, because a, a Democrat voting for Hogan for governor is one thing. Voting for him to be in the Senate is another thing. And Democrats are going to harp on uh, Larry Hogan's uh, sort of unclear record on abortion and reproductive care. They're going to talk about how this could flip control of the Senate to Republicans. And they're going to hammer on that message to say, hey, maybe he was OK as governor. But you as a Democrat, as a liberal voter, you don't want him in the Senate. He will do you know, more harm than good. That's, I think, what we're going to see in the general election. Yeah. And he just uh, there was a story today by the Associated Press where I think they were asking him, making sure he would continue to caucus with Republicans if he were elected. And he said, yes, <laughs> you know, that he's, he's a he's a Republican. And and to me, the you, you know, you've boiled it down, boiled it down very well about that. There are voters who liked Governor Hogan. They might still like him even through this race, but they also don't want Republicans to be in control of the United States Senate. Right. And so his favorability rating yeah. may not move uh, all that much, but that doesn't mean that they want all these other Republicans in charge, even if they like the Republican that they've had as governor. Um, and and the, the other thing that stuck out to me about the polls is I'm interested to see, let's get, you know, a month plus out from this primary, because I would, I'm going to make an educated guess that there are some Democratic voters who, let's say for also Brooks, who when asked in a general election, would you vote for David Trone? They're like, no, or they're having a hard time and saying, no, I'm, I'm an also Brooks, you know, or a Trone, a, a Trone supporter who say, would you vote for also Brooks in the general election? And say, like, yeah, no, you know, that they're, they're more on the fence because they're in the middle of this fight. But when we get beyond the primary, the dynamic is going to change. And I think we'll start to see that Democratic nominee, you know, make some progress in whatever lead Hogan has right now. Yeah, I think you're I think you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, remember, Larry Hogan has had like zero negative coverage of him since he launched. You know, they the Democrats have been focused on each other. Understandably, they have not been messaging strongly against Hogan. I mean, down here in Annapolis yesterday, there were some progressive groups and unions talking about why he would be a bad choice for Maryland. You know, but that was just a small press conference with a couple people. Um, it's going to ramp up after the primary. And I think Democrats. Democrats are going to educate voters on, look, a governor has a certain certain issues and a senator has other issues and those issues are important to you. Um, I, I think it will shift once voters say, well, whoever it is, it's it's the Democrat versus Larry Hogan and, you know, defeating Larry Hogan being more important than getting the the democratic candidate you prefer i think voters will get there and look i i spoke yesterday with one state lawmaker here who is you know full in for trone you know cut commercials for him and she said look whoever wins the next day i'm knocking on doors because i hate larry hogan so much and i think you'll probably see that democratic unity well one thing is for sure we will be talking about this race uh, all the way to november which as a marylander uh warms warms my heart <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let's keep it moving. There are, in addition to the Senate race, uh, a couple of interesting House races going on in Maryland as well. We're going to focus on just one here uh, right now, and that is in your home district of uh, Maryland's third, where Congressman John Sarbanes is not seeking re-election. Let's take a listen to a couple of the campaign ads that have been on the airwaves. Uh, in this district over the last couple weeks. You think after January 6th, we see change, but greedy corporations and corrupt politicians went right back to rigging the system. I'm Harry Dunn, and I'll protect democracy from more than just Donald Trump. I'm Sarah Elfrith, a Democrat running for Congress who knows how to get things done. From expanding abortion access, to banning guns in public places, increasing childcare funding, and much, much more. In Congress, I'll keep getting results for Maryland. Those were ads from former Capitol Police Officer Harry Dunn and State Senator Sarah Elfrith, uh, two of the many candidates running to succeed Sarbanes in the Democratic primary. Uh, there are a lot of people uh, in this race. I mean, a, a lot of 
current and former elected officials. But it, it, it does feel like uh, Dunn and Alfreth have uh, positioned themselves as the two leading uh, candidates in the race. I think just this morning, the Dunn campaign put out a poll showing him uh, nominally ahead of Elfrith, 22 to 18 percent with the rest. No other candidate, I think, uh, touching double digits. Um, this is your home district, Pamela. W- what has been the story of this race, uh, especially with with a guy like Harry Dunn and the national attention and, and celebrity that he brings to what what is typically a, a pretty quiet congressional district? Uh, Yeah, this is uh, super interesting. And there are 22, 22 (laughs) Democrats on the ballot. And let me tell you, we've just put out our voters guide at the Baltimore banner where we do questionnaires and wrangling 22 people uh, to try and answer emails is is a challenge. Um, Is certainly, you know, Harry Dunn getting in the race kind of upended things because you have a bunch of people who are running who are you know, state lawmakers, local business owners, lawyers, that sort of thing. And then suddenly you have this celebrity, you know, hero cop with national connections. I mean, he just, his fundraising reports just came out and he raised, you know, millions of dollars, you know, way more than anybody else. Um, He has money from across the country, interestingly. Um, Something like 90% of his money comes from outside of Maryland. And To be clear, he does not live in the district. Now, of course, you do not have to live in the district. He lives in Silver Spring, uh, just outside uh, D.C., and this district is basically a Baltimore suburban district in Howard and Anne Arundel. But yes, Harry Dunn, State Senator Sarah Elfrith, kind of ahead of the pack. Uh, I would add in also State Senator Clarence Lamb, who's from Howard County. He's sitting on about half a million dollars uh, in these final weeks, so he's got some money Uh, to be competitive and get his message out there. Everybody else really kind of struggling to gain a foothold with money or with polling. Um, But I I really think it's a low information and a low interest race. Um, I I don't know that voters are are very aware of who the candidates are or even that there is, you know, a congressional race. Yeah. And this race also got a bit of a shakeup when, uh, United Democracy Project, which is the the super PAC affiliate of APAC, um, got involved here on behalf of Alfred uh, to right. the tune of, uh, I haven't checked the recent numbers, but it was an initial buy of like $600,000. Maybe it's up over a million now, you know, running pro Alfred ads, giving her some additional firepower. Uh, that I know, uh, you know, Dunn and his campaign were were very upset about that. I think there was a lot of uh, immediate reaction from Dunn on APAC getting involved here. And it was a little bit confusing as to why they were, because neither uh, Dunn nor Alfred are particularly, no one looks at them and says, you know, their positions on Israel are, 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 are one thing or the other. And I know I think they both have good relationships um, with, with APAC. And, and as it turns out, I think, uh, it, it was because of an uh, ostensibly because of another candidate in the race, John Morse, a labor lawyer who has taken some positions on Israel uh, that were uh, more frightening to to the folks at APAC. And, and so they felt by going in for Alfred, they were going to box him out, even though, as all the polling shows, he's he's not really a factor. So uh, an interesting development there. Yeah, that that. Um... Uh, money coming in and those ads for Alfred, um, yeah, they are sort of boosting her signal. And, and what's interesting is like we had Harry Dunn and some of the other candidates out here in Annapolis a few weeks ago, standing in the rain, uh, decrying this involvement uh, in in the race. Um, but e- even beside that, like on the surface, all the advertising, all the flyers, like they're not really talking about you know Israel and the Gaza war. It's um, again, we're seeing mostly the biographical kind of, uh, you know, above board kind of stuff going on in in the race. So, but it is boosting her. Still, she has nowhere near as much money uh, and, and, and firepower, even with that APAC affiliated money coming in. And this yeah. race is a good example of why it's important to turn out in primaries, because this primary is effectively electing a member of Congress. I mean, there will still be a general Absolutely. election, but it's more of a formality. And so I think we're, I need, I should have looked at the list before we started recording this podcast about, I mean, there's already probably up to 10, including close to 10 members uh, or, or 10 candidates who have won competitive primaries in solid 
districts. I'm looking at a bunch of races in California and elsewhere where the, again, the, the next Congress is taking shape. And so it's important uh, to, you know, to vote in general elections as well as primaries, because sometimes that's the biggest game. Yeah, that, and that's absolutely the case in the third district. There's, I believe, nine Republicans running in the primary, none of them with any name recognition, money, wherewithal. They're, they're really just not going to have much of a chance. So, you know, May 14th, Election Day, Harry Dunn, Sarah Alfred, Clarence Lamb, somebody else, like that's almost guaranteed to be the winner in the general. And yeah, that's your member of yeah, Congress. And no runoff, right? I mean, a, a plurality yeah. and this with that many candidates, it could be a, a pretty low uh the, a low winning percentage uh, to, to get there. Yeah, absolutely. And what's interesting is like even the folks who don't have money, um, some of them include um, state delegates, delegate Mike Rogers from Anne Arundel, delegate Terry Hill from Howard County. Um, I mentioned Clarence Lamb, state senator from Howard County. People are used to seeing their names on the ballots and voting for them. They might have seen them in the local news for you know what they do here in Annapolis. So they could just based on familiarity, like siphon off some votes away from those higher contenders and yeah you could win this with i don't know 15 or 20 you know 20 percent could win yeah it's kind of wild we don't have time to talk about them today but we also have open primaries in the second district where congressman dutch Ruppersberger is uh headed to the exits and the sixth district where david trone is vacating obviously a uh, more competitive race in the sixth district we'll have to have you come back sometime in the future and talk about those other ones uh but we are Going to keep things moving here and head over to our final segment of the day. And finally, our last segment, Look What I Found, where we highlight something new that we've come across in our daily lives. It could be political, music, sports, or something else entirely. Uh, you never know what you're going to get. Uh, so Nathan, uh, why don't you kick us off today? Uh, what did you find? Yeah, well, I found a, a band called Action Adventure, which I've talked about previously on this podcast. They're from Chicago. Uh, I think they're called Easy Core, which is a mix of probably pop punk with some hardcore in it. Anyway, they're playing in D.C. in May, and I bought tickets. I'm going to try to go. I haven't been to a show in a long time, uh, but I and I'm not supposed to be speaking to any group about the elections, uh, but I, I'm excited. Uh, we'll see. Uh, yeah, I, I'm excited. I used to go to more shows a lot more frequently, but uh, we'll see. And if there's any uh, listeners to the podcast that find me at the show, I, I, I'm going to say it. I'll give you a, a six month subscription inside elections. If you find me at the, at the action adventure show <laughs> in DC. Well, uh, if someone takes you up on that, you gotta, you gotta shout them out on the podcast. Uh, Cause I would be very impressed. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, I'm guessing it's a very small crossover segment of people. Sliver of the Venn diagram. I don't um, know. In DC, I feel like anything is possible, right? Like right. people pay attention. Let's go for it. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Uh, Pamela, what did you find this week? Uh, so I have not found much new lately because I'm just coming off of Maryland's legislative session, which is 90 days of like <laughs> working 10 hour days every day. Um, but I did, I might be the last person on the planet to pick up the Heaven and Earth Grocery Store by James McBride. Um, it's a really great book. I'm really enjoying it very much. And it's nice to be able to read something for pleasure that is not like a fiscal analysis of a, of a policy bill. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly different, slightly different genres, I guess, of, of reading. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I've, I've, I've heard good things about it. It's on my list. Uh, so uh, we'll have to get to it, but good to know it's, it's uh, as good as people say. What did I find? I found ramps um, and not the, not the, the thing for getting up to a higher surface, but the, the wild uh, root vegetable uh, allium that, that uh, only grows for about three weeks of the year out in Western Maryland and West Virginia and uh, places like that. Uh, we are kind of at the tail end of ramp season, but I have been taking full advantage uh, of of the ramps that have become available, doing all sorts of things with them, uh, pesto and and uh, if I had a grill, I'd be grilling them all the time. But I really like them. They're they're like a cool, fun thing you only get for a couple weeks of the year. So we'll see if the Dupont Circle Farmers Market still has them this this weekend. Uh, but they have for the last couple weeks, and so they might be running out. But that is my uh, latest in culinary adventures with Jacob. 
Does this go with wild, your rabbit that you're going to be wild making? Wild rant. I, you know, I bet you could do, <laughs> Pamela, I, 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 my grocery store started stocking rabbit uh, oh, recently. Oh, my. And, and, and I impulse bought rabbit from, from the butcher shop. <laughs> I haven't made it yet, uh, but Nathan, uh, Nathan thinks that's uh, pretty funny. <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure Ramps and Rabbit would, would go wonderfully together. Uh, I'll have to have you over for dinner, Nathan. And I, can... <laughs> I, might, I might need to eat before. And I, not that I don't trust you. <laughs> this is, this is, that is stretching the, the, uh, the, the, my, my guardrails of what I consider to be uh, proper eating. Uh, so we'll see. All right. Well, on that note, that is all the time we have we talked through the Maryland Senate Democratic primary, the general election, uh, some of those uh, House races in Maryland that are coming up in just a few short weeks. Um, Pamela, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this really was a pleasure, and we hope to have you on back again as, as these Maryland races continue to be uh, at the forefront of people's minds. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It was fun. At Inside Elections, we provide nonpartisan analysis of congressional, presidential, and gubernatorial races. With a combination of reporting and data, we break down the key races and bring valuable context to complex elections. Go to InsideElections.com to subscribe to the bi-weekly newsletter. We've got individual subscriptions and group packages that are tailored for association and corporate packs. If you like this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and rate us on your favorite platform. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the thumbs up button, leave a comment, and be sure to subscribe. If you don't like today's episode, please email Anthony Daniels, the C-3PO actor, not the failed congressional candidate. We also wanted to thank our producers, Alan Tuzinski and Melissa Lenner of Pretty Easy Podcasts, and associate producer, Conrad Tolosa. Please come back and join us next time. <laughs>